Welcome to the Josh Heisman Podcast. Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast. And I am super excited to have a conversation with a guy who I, I met today for the first time in person, but we've been kind of touching base <laughs> back and forth on social media. Yeah. His name is Marcus Manise. He is the founder and operator of the nonprofit organization Stronger Than My Father. Yep. That is also a podcast that he puts out there. There's a yeah. lot of good stuff that we're going to talk about today because I think this man's mission and what he is doing is so vitally important to, to not only this community, but the world. Thank you. And something that when I when I first, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't tell you this, first time I became aware of what you're doing, I heard you on the Nick Hyder uh, Hit Streak podcast. Yeah, my buddy which, Nick. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, and this went back a couple of years ago yeah. when, when you were on that, that episode. I think it was like, it was like his early episodes. Yeah, I think I was like number eight. Yeah. So, yeah. so anyway, I'm I'm so excited to have you in here and you got your own podcast and everything. How about how about we start from the beginning of Stronger Than My Father? Yeah. Where did Stronger Than My Father come from? Uh twenty one years, my mom asked me to mentor my cousin. And the first question I asked her was like, Where's his daddy? Why are you asking me to do it? And mm. I said, Don't you, these kids have fathers, right? And I'm twenty seven years old, naive, and my mom said he doesn't have a father. And I said, wow, kids growing up without dads now? And my mom was like, yeah. Not realizing that my wife grew up without a father. And I asked her mom for a hand in marriage. But, you know, I wasn't thinking about it. And then that was 2003. And then 10 years later, my youngest son, my oldest son at the time, had a shirt that said, strong like dad. And I'm putting it on him, Greg, take him to uh, bowling. And God whispered in my ear, stronger than my father. And mm -hmm. it's like I froze and I was like, man, it's catchy. Let me write it down. And I didn't know I was just going to do public speaking. That's what that was my first goal, just speak about fatherhood, bring awareness. Mm -hmm. Then um, there was a lady convinced me to do a nonprofit. But the title came from my son's shirt that said Strong Like That. And God whispered Stronger Than My Father. And then the catchphrase, the cycle ends with me, it was just research. Uh, once I was really introduced to fatherhood, and some of the issues, I just started reading, researching, and I realized that fatherhood was a cycle. So somebody has to find a way to break it, and I just felt through mentorship would be one opportunity to help kids who don't have a father have the opportunity to become a productive citizen. That's awesome. So if, let me just think about timelines here for yeah. just a moment, okay? Were you a father yourself when your mom asked you to, to help with no. your— I so wasn't a father. You weren't. So no. was it kind of an added pressure to go, wait, why are you asking me to come No, because first time I asked, my mom told me, I said, no. Uh, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And she said, okay. And then she come back a couple uh, a couple months later, asked me again. I said, no. And then she has a cold word. She said, well, just do it for your mama. And if she <laughs> says that, I'm going to do it. And so from there, our relationship became like father and son. So, you know, I have a picture in my uh, living room of me and my cousin uh, wearing uh, Dwayne Wade and Shaq jerseys, and that was in 07. Mm -hmm. So I realized that kids and have dads needed love. They needed somebody to be there for them or be an example. And from 10 years after that, that's when I started my nonprofit, Call Strong and My Father, just to bring awareness to fatherhood and help those kids who didn't have a father figure in the home have the best opportunity Mm -hmm. to be successful. And that's why the organization exists. So you, you said something interesting there. Did you grow up? Was your father in the yeah. home? Yeah, I grew up with my father. Um, my father, Paul Manny Sr., um, one of the greatest men on earth to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, everything I learned, who I am as a man, um, come through my father. So that's the reason why I didn't know kids was growing up. Because all of my life I spent with my dad. Yeah. And then I only went to church because me and my two brothers wanted to get away from daddy because he worked us so much. <laughs> so mom gave us the opportunity to go to church. And mm -hmm. she said, uh, but daddy would say, hey, you can go to church. But if you're not dressed appropriately, you have to go work with me. So we had, uh -huh. that's how we learned how to dress to go to church and stuff like that. So everything was sent through my dad. Yeah, because when you just mentioned that and, and said, what, doesn't every home have a father? Kids growing up without fathers yeah. now. I mean, so you had that upbringing. And so it's it's interesting to me that you are have been called by God into this ministry yeah. that you're doing. It really is a ministry because, mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, if you take it one step further, you're called into something that, uh, would you say you're not familiar with? So yeah. now you are because now you're, you're operating in that world. <laughs> yeah. uh, but... 
it's so cool that you have decided to say, wait a minute, not everyone had the upbringing that I had. Not everyone yeah. had the strong father who raised me in the home, but I want to step out and I want to help those who don't have that experience in yeah. any way that I can. Have you had any pushback from people who say, hey, you don't know what it feels like. So oh, you yeah. Should, yeah. Yeah. The pushback, you know, once we started the podcast, that's when I really started seeing the pushback, um, mainly because I didn't, I wasn't. A lot of people say I didn't have the street knowledge. Um, I grew up sheltered um, mm. because my parents ensured us a lot of the bad stuff that was out in the world, so they really protected us from that. So basically, I'm coming in with not, not a lot of experience, having went through a lot what these boys have gone through, but the biggest thing I could offer them was love and being there for them. So when they had a ball game, they see me in the stands mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hang out, go grab something to eat. You know, I was there as a presence. So I can't always help with some of the trauma that these boys have gone through, but I can be a presence and I can be there as an example to say, hey, yeah, I'm not your dad, but I want to be the closest thing to you like a father figure in your life to know, hey, you can pick up the phone and call Mr. Marcus when I need you. And that's kind of what I've learned through this experience. Yeah. You know, I've been in full time ministry now for over 20 years. Yeah. And one of the things that I've noticed is people tend to gravitate to like-minded people. Yeah. And people who have similar experiences to them. Mm -hmm. And they do that because they don't want to break a generational experience of what they have going on. For example, yeah. in, with what you're doing. And, yeah. and I asked that question, do you, do you get any pushback? Do you yeah. get whatever it may be? And you said, yeah, when I started the podcast and, and I started sharing what I have going on, I think people push back because they, you have to step out of that, that what is familiar to you to break a generational thing. Yeah, yeah. And what we would rather do is surround ourselves with like-minded people so we yeah. can just continue the cycle. We yeah. can pass that on yeah, to the next yeah, generation. We yeah. can pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. And then when someone comes in and says... Hey, I want to help. I want to be a part of breaking that cycle. Yeah, that's where the pushback comes from. Don't yeah. touch. Don't yeah. touch my my nerves here. You know. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying with the pushback. Yeah, I did see that a lot. Mainly because some people didn't want to change. Um, some people want to keep that part of their lives hidden, and that's the thing that's destroying people. Is because you got to talk about it. You you have to find ways to get help. Um, if you're going through past pain because you didn't have your father in your life. You know, seek help because if if you don't seek help, that's going to continue to carry you on through your relationships, um, through marriage. And, and, you know, a lot of them issues that you see people have, I guarantee you, if you center it back, it's going to come back to didn't have my father in the home, mm -hmm. didn't have the tools, didn't have the teaching. Or I seen my father, you know, do this or my father do that. Even if they was present at home, they wasn't a great example. And so that's why I think sometimes you get the pushback because we want to suppress it. We don't really want to think about it. But sometimes not having that father figure shows to your actions. Mm -hmm. So when you see domestic violence on the rise, if you ever ask, you know, that's a learned behavior. Uh, you just don't wake up and just start beating on people. That's a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes I get the pushback that I receive. But I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about it. And if it bothers you, then I'm sorry. But the problem is, is that when we keep looking on TV, when we look on television and we see these boys acting up, carjacking, stealing, you have to sit back and say, who was their father? Mm -hmm. Who taught them that? My father never taught me how to go carjack nobody. My father didn't teach me. He taught me hard work ethics and what it takes to be a man. Yeah. And that's the reason why I'm trying to help break some cycles and give boys an opportunity and a chance to have a better life so you don't have to go into a life of crime or anything like that. You can go to college or you can get a life skill. Mm -hmm. That's what's needed. And so if, if men who have been blessed to be successful can give back a little of their time to say, you know what, let me pick one young man up. I'm not telling you to change the world, but I'm telling you to just help one child have a better life. And I think if we did that, then you will have an opportunity to be successful. Yeah, that is so true. When you think about it, you know, every time you do something, there's there's a first time that, yeah. you, that you did it. Yeah. And somebody walked alongside you and showed you how to do it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, my my father in in, in our home, you know, mm. there were certain things that were off limits. There were certain things that he says, here's here's what we don't do. Yeah. And here's what we do do. Yeah. Uh, and if 
if someone comes along and says, hey, you should do this with us or whatever it may be, and, and yeah. you make a decision that you're going to do that, just know that I'm here. Yeah. And I'll eventually yeah. find out about it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah. listen, I made some mistakes and made some bad decisions and whatever it may be. And dad was there to help with course correction and all yeah. of that. That's what being a father is all about, isn't yeah. it? Uh, but when that presence is not there, yeah, is when someone will come along and fill that gap. Yeah. And someone will come along and teach you their ways. Yep. And so that's that's where you know that work you're doing I think just becomes so important. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. South side. Oh, yeah. wow. And so I'm I'm familiar with yeah. uh, my first 3 years of youth ministry as a youth pastor were was uh, in a town called South Holland but it's right next to Harvey, Illinois. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of gangs, a lot of different things going on there. Yeah. And so I'm very familiar with working with young people who don't have fathers in the home. Yeah. And you would see how how gangs kind of would come along and and fill in that space. Mm-hmm. And you know, mentor. Yep. Walk alongside, initiate, uh train, all yeah. all of those things but in in all of the negative ways of what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. And there needed to be a father there to stop that. Yeah, I mean, if you have a good father, he's going to protect you. And that's what your father sounded like your father did. He was a protector. Mm-hmm. And same as mine. I have two boys, 15 and 8. My job is protect them from the bad stuff, but teach them there are bad things out here. And one thing my father told us, you know, you make your bed, you got to sleep in it. Mm. And so he gave us, you know, free reign to go do what you want to do. But remember, my parents said, if you go to jail, don't call us. We're not coming to get you out. So as me and my brothers had to try to make better decisions with our lives. But we had the best example. And my father was a protector. We couldn't go out and do a lot of things that um, a lot of kids did. And we used to think, oh, y'all mean. But when you get older, you realize they did those things because they were trying to protect us. Mm-hmm. And so me as a father now, having a 15-year-old with a cell phone has been a challenge to me. Because when I was 15, there was no such thing as, you know, oh, the man. little tiny cell phone. Could you imagine? Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't imagine what my parents would have done, <laughs> <laughs> done if I had, we had TikTok and all that back in the 90s. But now, you know, I grab my son's phone from time to time. I never tell him, so let me see your phone, see what you're looking at. And I said, first thing I see something is not right, it's gone. Mm. So he knows the rules up front of what he needs to be doing. And kids are kids. But my job as a dad is to be a protector. You know, and tell you that these things, you know, whatever you feel and you see is going to go in your mind. And so I don't want my son doing bad stuff because he sees some on social media and that's not the right example. So it's my my job as a father to be strict on him about his cell phone usage Mm because he knows the rules. He knows the rules. And between him and my wife, we we really hard on him about his phone. Yeah. So, yeah. Did Stronger Than My Father come along before you had kids, or was this you had kids? Yeah, my, had my, my oldest was young. He was young. I think he was five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when Stronger Than My Father come along. Um, like I said, I was going to do motivated speaking, and I was like, that's a platform. A lot of people talk, but how many people are doing the work? How many people are working on the ground? Because mm-hmm. we have plenty of motivated speakers. We have plenty of people that likes to talk, talk, talk. But who's actually going out here grabbing a kid to say, hey, man, I'm going to show you a different path and spend time with them. I've had kids I've worked with for four years. Uh, One was just recently on my podcast that we talked about some of those things where, hey, he watched me how I was treating my younger son. He he said, man, I even watched how you treated your wife. And I was like, at 15? (laughs) He was like, I was watching you. So that's why, you know, stronger my father's around is to bring awareness to a problem. And I know there's so many other causes out here. That's um, nonprofits, you know, serve my homelessness, you know, things with women, moms, girls, it's a lot. But a lot of your biggest issues is that fathers in the house protecting their child. They have a 90 percent chance to become productive if the father is in the home. And, and one thing I will say, mm-hmm. and this, I hope this ain't controversial, is a Christian father. If you have a love for God, you're going to love your wife. You're going to love your kids Mm -hmm. if your love for God, if you have a close relationship with God, because a father will pray for his family. A father will lead his family. And that's what you're supposed to do. I learned that through Tony Evans. Mm -hmm. And uh, for my father, who didn't go to church a lot, he still led. You know, he still led. He didn't tell my mom that, hey, y'all can't go to church. You got to work. No, he said, no, you get an opportunity to go to church because he knew the importance of it. 
So he gave us that. And that's why I just use my voice to bring awareness. And I'm not here to talk. Mm-hmm. I work. Yeah. So you know, many Saturdays, I'm picking up kids, uh, hanging out for at least two hours before my wife says, hey, come up and come back home. It's time for you to be with the family. Mm-hmm. But um, they just all like my kids. They all like my boys. And I'm trying my best to give them the best opportunity, the best life. Yeah. So they can be productive where we don't have to mean you sitting at home on Channel 4, Channel 5, or you know, we like, wow, another young man carjacked, another mm-hmm. young man's dead. You know, bring awareness to fatherhood. Yeah. Well, I love Tony Evans' book, Raising Kingdom Kids. Yeah, Kingdom Kids. I, mean, yeah. I love Tony Evans in general. I, he's, yeah. he's a great man, great pastor. Uh, love what he's doing. One of the things you're talking about here. I don't think there's anything controversial at all about saying you need to be a Christian <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, ch- you know, when people sometimes look at church and stuff and they would say, but I would just tell you, you know, I wouldn't be the father that I am if I had a relationship with God. Yeah. Because I pray a lot. Yeah. I pray every time my wife leaves that driveway, I tell God, please bless you and make it back home. Every right. time my kids walk into a school, I say, God, if it's your will, let me see my kids when they come out of school. So every right. day... I pick up my kids from school and I can see them. I always tell God, thank you. Right. Well, so, here's the interesting thing about this is why I say it's not controversial. It's yeah. only controversial if people can disagree with it and they do yeah. what they want. It doesn't change the fact that it's true. Yeah. So Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not exactly. He's not a way. He's not a truth. He's not a life. Yeah. He's the, yeah. the, the. So yeah. if he is the truth, then the only truth is this. The closer as a father you get to Jesus in yeah. your own personal relationship, yeah, because he is the truth, that means all other things will get better. Yeah. They, they will, because the more you d- you pursue Christ in who yeah. you are, you will be a better husband. Yeah. You will be a better father. You yeah. will be a better friend. You mm-hmm. all those things, whatever. But if but that has to come first. Yeah. Your relationship with Christ, right? Yeah. And and that th- this is for me. Where I, I think people get upset about certain things because <laughs> because you know they go well you know that might work for you but that yeah. no listen no no uh, this is what God's word says okay yeah. so this isn't Josh talking this isn't Marcus talking this is yeah. just this is God's word yeah given to us and ways to live right yeah because the closer we get to Jesus he's going to say hey, here's how you're going to do it deny yourself take up your cross follow him yeah right yeah. What is a what is it to be a father? Mm-hmm. Like if in that in that principle of what I just yeah. said, think about this, right? How many even those who are fathers and, and yeah. they're in the home, how many fathers put themselves before their kids and and maybe they put their career before their kids? Yeah, or they put their stuff. You know, I'm, I'm talking well, to you. Gonna, well, well, you're gonna run into problems when you yeah. do that. Um, I think that you know one thing my father taught me was he said when you become a father, your kids come first, you come second. Mm-hmm. He says, you should never look better than your kids. You know, That's when good. you step out the house, you better. I, I can't go keep buying me tennis shoes and clothes and watches, stuff that I like to buy. And my kids don't look raggedy. Mm-hmm. You know, if dad goes and get a haircut, my kids need to have good, nice haircuts. So that's why they go every two weeks mm-hmm. to get a haircut because their dad goes and get go get a haircut. So everything is centered around my kids, even in marriage. You know, you have to find a balance to between being in love with your wife and also a balance of um, making sure that your kids are together. Mm-hmm. Everything is balanced. But for me, it was that I always make sure, I always ask my wife, do kids need anything? They need anything. Before I get on my apps and want to buy stuff, is my kids good? Do they mm-hmm. have what they need? Um, because I don't. that's just a principle that I'm putting in my book that I think men need to know. Yeah, everything is balanced. Now, being married for almost twenty three years now, everything's been balanced, and that's what fathers have to do to be successful. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So you say you have two boys, two boys, fifteen year old and a and an eight year old, and an eight year old. Yeah, well, that's a big gap right there. So that's gonna... well, I, I think the gap was because I was cool with just one kid. Mm-hmm. You know, let me get this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was cool with one kid. Um, I didn't want two. Um, I just wanted one. And he had my name. I'm like, why do I need more kids? And so, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but my, my my wife was like, he needs a sibling. And I and here's the thing. <laughs> this is probably one of the bad side of father for me is that I look at the money. I was like, how much it costs for daycare and diapers and You're not supposed to think you know, about that stuff. Yeah, you don't. But see, I think that <laughs> I think that sometimes with fathers is that you know, you got to think of the cost. If you're going to go out and have a bunch of kids, it's just my opinion yeah. that, you know, think of the cost because it costs a lot. 
And so that's why I had the big gap because once you was in kindergarten, private school was done and I was cool. But my wife was like, we need one more. He needs a playmate. And I'm thankful that we have my, my second son, Jordan, because he gets on my oldest son nerves and I love watching it. <laughs> so uh, I was driving here and my son, my oldest son said that my, my youngest son won't leave him alone. And as a father, I just sit back and laugh because I was just like that with my oldest brother. I was getting mm. on his nerves. But um, that experience uh, with my two boys has been one of the joys because if most people who follow me on social media, they see that every time I'm with somebody doing mentorship, my two boys are there. Either one, both of them are there or one of them. Mm. I never want to neglect my boys because I'm helping other people. Yeah, My boys can't ever say that daddy took time for everybody else. But he never took time for me. They can't ever say that. Mm. That's the things I learned from my dad. I learned from all those tools and, and tips that helped me become the father that I am today. That's awesome. The guy you met when you came in here, yeah. th- his name is Jordan. That's my yeah. second son. Your second son. Yeah. That's so, cool. He's doing all the engineering stuff for you. That's he cool. Is, yeah. And, and your second son is Jordan, too. Yeah. And, and he annoys the older brother. I don't know. Jordan's in, <laughs> Jordan's in the other room. I don't know how much yeah. he, he annoys his older brother. I think they get along pretty good. But, yeah. But... Uh, but that's but I don't think one I think now with my um um one can't go without the other. I think my oldest son if he goes off to college, my youngest son's gonna be really sad because he's gonna like, where's my brother? Yeah. But one thing I did teach my brothers, and my father taught me this, he told I told him y'all always stay close. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father told me, he said, You always stay close to your siblings. He said, I don't care when y'all get married and move off, move on from each other. You always stay close to each other. So mm-hmm. me and my brothers are close. Um, I'm close to my youngest sister. She's kind of like, you know, when when I have something in my mind, I call her. Mm-hmm. But my youngest brother, close. You know, we don't talk all the time, but if we need each other, are we just a phone call away? And that's what siblings, you know, I, I hear a lot of people have sibling rivals and siblings can't get along mm-hmm. and, that's different for me because uh, I love both of my brothers. I love both of them and my sister. But it, all that came through, my father. My father gave us these tilts as we was growing up. And, hey, y'all stick together no matter what. And so when we was, my parents were doing their wills and telling who's going to get what, yeah. no one argued. That, yeah, that stuff, what your father was doing, it, it, it seems so simple. Yeah. It, it, it's it seems common sense, but it, it's not happening enough. Where yeah. What he what the father does is sets the expectation for the family. I like that. And you just and lay he's laying that out right. The, mm-hmm. Hey, you got your brothers and you got your sister. It's it's going to be you all. Yeah. You're going to have friends come in. You're going to have if you're in sports or if you're in in extracurricular activities, you'll have these different people come into your life. But here here's this is your core. Yeah. This is your group. Y'all need to stay close to each other. Yeah. And not all families operate in that way, but your dad set that expectation. Yeah. And he said, This is how this this is how the Manise family yeah. is gonna operate. You got my last name right. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. like I you know, my brothers and I played sports. Growing up, we were baseball players, right? Baseball, okay. And, yeah, all three I see of us. with the Chicago White Sox, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, um, okay, I see it. We're baseball players, and my dad, who listens to this podcast, he'll, he'll laugh yeah. when I say this, but my dad would watch us on the field, and my three brothers and I, my two brothers and I, were uh, within three years of each other. So yeah. my older brother, when he was a senior in high school, I was a junior, and then my younger brother was a freshman. Yeah. We were often on the same baseball team together. Yeah. And he would say things like, look, okay, so if you're going to play baseball, Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't want to see you on the field talking trash, you're doing yeah. whatever. Okay, I want if you're going to do your talking, you talk with your bat and you talk with your glove. I like that. But that was his thing. Mm-hmm. And so he put that out there for us, and yeah. that's how we operated on the baseball field. Yeah. And it wasn't because, hey, I came up with that. Yeah. And there were moments when that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And then when that didn't happen, mom and dad were in the stands going, yeah. Look, you know, yeah. <laughs> you done crossed the line. Yep. You know, that's it. That's we'll talk it. about this at home. Yeah. You know, so that's the expectation, right? Yeah. And that becomes so important. Well, you need that. I think what you have, you had the example. You had the example of what you needed. And mm-hmm. what you said that really resonated with me was that your dad was on the field. Mm-hmm. He was there watching you. You know, a lot of my boys in my program don't have that. Mm-hmm. They don't have a, a, a dad to. Root them all. That's why I try to go to as many football games or track meets or basketball of my boys in my program that I can make. Mm-hmm. I say, if you give me the schedule, I'm going to be there because they don't have nobody there rooting them on. And when these kids see 
other kids' dads rub them on their back or pat them on the head. Um, it's tough. Yeah. And prime example is, is Jordan, my, my youngest. He just started soccer. And so I took him to soccer practice yesterday, but every time he kicked the ball, who was he looking at? He wanted to see dad's approval. Yeah, right. And I would give him a thumbs up. That's when kids don't have that. That's when you start seeing kids have all kind of anger, attitude, mood swings. And it's sending because they're hurting. They're hurting because my daddy ain't there. And if you look at most NFL games, when they turn around to the camera, who do they say hi to? Mom. Mom. Right. How often have you seen where they say, hey, dad? That's where I try to bring awareness. I'm not saying it's not a problem doing that because I, I love my mama now. Oh, yeah. I can tell you, I love my mom. Mm-hmm. But every time I see that, I was like, man, they never say to dad. Or when I see someone on TV, I look at my wife, I was like, where's the daddy? And she goes off. I don't know. They ain't, you know, because she's still dealing with that mm-hmm. uh, issue growing up with her, her father in the home. So that's the things that I like to just bring awareness of. Not to bash, but. If we see a problem here in this world, what are we doing to try to fix the problem? Yeah, right. And so once I realized fatherhood is never going to be fixed, it's never. People are going to continue to have babies. The thing is, is my mother told me the best example. She said, son, save one. She mm-hmm. said, son, if you could just save one kid, you've done your job. Yeah. And that actually helped. That was like therapy for me because I was trying to save everybody. Whoever came to my program, I'm going to work hard to save you. But my mother told me that right there. She said, son, save one. Right. And that's what helped me. To the, that's why. That's what keeps me going today is that, hey, I'm not going to be able to help everybody. I've accepted that. But if I can get one out of high school, if I can get one out of college um, or gain a life skill, or I can see that young man become a father, because one of the boys in my program is a young father now, um, that's what makes me happy if you're there for your kid. Mm-hmm. Well, you're doing something that it would be very easy to become discouraged. Yeah. Because yeah. it is such a uh, monumental task. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a... I heard you say this on one of your podcasts that I thought that was good. Is yeah. You said this lack... The fatherhood, this yeah. is the real pandemic. Yeah, it's a pandemic. This is the real issue yeah. that's that's that needs to be addressed in this world. And, and I thought... Yeah. That is true. And I think of, you know, in our homes, mm-hmm. uh, God created the mother and the father for a reason. They play very specific and important roles yep. in the home. Yep. Okay. And that story I shared about my father, I could share, yeah. you, I could share you many stories of, of how my mother, uh, what she did and how she raised us, mm-hmm. played such an important role in our lives. And they worked together. Yeah. In, in that, in what they played. And if I didn't have one without the other, but there's so many kids yeah. who don't have... Either one. Either one. No. Yeah. You know? So there's there's definitely more homes that have the mother involved. But yep. I'll tell you, going back to when I sat on the um, South Side of Chicago doing youth ministry, Yeah, a lot of times I had... It was grandparents bringing the kids. Yep. I've seen that before. Mom's I've seen and dad, that, yeah. neither, neither mom or dad in the home. So, yeah. I mean, it was a crazy world. Well, look at the statistics. One out of four has a biological father in the home, one out of four homes. And statistics shows a little bit over 18 million kids are growing up here in America. Can you say that? Again? Wait, are you? One what, out of four. One out, there's in, in four homes, only one of them has a father? A biological father. Those are statistics. And wow. over 18 million kids are growing up without a father in the home, boys or girls. No father in the house. So who's leading the family? That's the biggest key. That and is the pandemic. We, we're in the church pandemic. I mean, we're in the church. So yeah. um, Satan's job has always been designed to disrupt God's plan. Mm-hmm. God had a plan. Just like when you have a bicycle, you have instructions on how to put a bike together. If you don't do it by the instructions, you have problems. That's what we have in America. When there's no father in the house leading the house, mm-hmm. that's, you run into Oops. problems. No problem. Also, it was never designed for single moms to do all the work. Single mom's supposed to be a helpmate for the dad. So me and you both know this. Mm -hmm. But to the people that's listening, audience, that's where our problem starts at. So when I see single moms that's frustrated, and I've been around them, that's frustrated, that's been through trauma, that's been through these situations, it's hard to raise a young man. It's very hard. And so when these young men have these issues, that's when you go, they look at alternative games, they look at all these other different things that they see on social media. Young men... And I think social media is, is, I say, one of the great things, and it could be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that young men who don't know 
and don't have a father are looking for something to show them what it takes to be a man. And if they see, okay, I need to have jury, I need to do this, I need to do that, and they see that's the pattern, therefore they're going to go. My dad had us a different pattern. Hard work, man don't need to work eight hours and go home and sleep. It's just hard work, and that's the problem. And I think that we have to bring awareness of it. And then my thing is that I can talk all day, but I'm trying. I'm trying my best to fix a problem that I think is never going to be solved. Mm -hmm. But like I told you beginning, I'm only trying to save one. Yeah. And I think if I can do that, I feel like when God takes my life, when when it's time for me to leave this earth, let me say it in that frame, I'm at peace. And I'm at peace because I did everything on this earth that God wanted me to do, even though it was never my plan. And so when people like you say, hey, you've been called to this, sometimes I'll be like, oh, I hate hearing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I do understand, the thing I do understand is that um, I really enjoyed um, helping young men. Uh, mm-hmm. In my last mentor session, i give an example. It was a, uh, one of the parents said, hey, my friend has a seven-year-old kid that just want to hang with you guys. And I said, yeah, just bring them. Mm-hmm. Bring them, you know, forget the application process. Just let them hang with me. And that kid hugged me at the end and said, thank you. I enjoyed myself. Kid has no mother, has no father. Mm-hmm. So that's what keeps pulling me. Because somebody asked me in an interview yesterday, do you get tired of doing this? And I said, yeah, mm-hmm. I do. But those little kids like that at seven years old, he has a shot yeah. at being successful. Or he's going to be another kid that we're going to have to go see in juvenile. Or another kid that's going to go to jail. And you don't want that. <laughs> and we don't want that. No. That's why I do the work that I do. And it's just bringing awareness. And uh, sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet. But that's just who I am as an individual. Uh, that's why I tell people, if you disagree, uh, I have a platform. You can come talk to me and let's debate. Mm-hmm. And you tell me another path. If there's another path that I need to take to help change young men's lives, tell me mm-hmm. the other path. Yeah. Because I only see it one way, and that's spending time with these young men and being present in their lives. So that's what I really, really enjoy doing. Yeah. I'm I'm looking through my phone here now. No, go ahead. In my Bible reading this morning, yeah. you brought you brought something to mind that this morning I was just reading about this, right? Yeah. And and I was reading about Moses. Yeah. And in Exodus chapter two is where Moses' story really starts when he's born. Yeah. Uh, and by by you get get to the end of chapter two in Exodus, and you you get to the story where Moses uh, he kills this Egyptian guy, and then he flees and he goes off to a yeah. foreign land. Yeah, and it says at the end there, you know, he 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 finds a wife, mm-hmm. he gets married, and it says, and he was comfortable with his life. That's me. Okay, <laughs> and, I knew where you was going with this. And, yeah. he was, and he was comfortable with his life. And yeah. then you turn to the end of the chapter and it says, Israel, though, the people of Israel who were slaves in Egypt yeah. were crying out for a deliverer. Yeah. So on one side, you had Moses who's comfortable <laughs> with his life. And then you have the yeah. people who are crying out, somebody help. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so... That, when you're just saying that, now think about that. So Moses then, when God calls Moses and he has the burning bush experience yeah, burning bush and experience. says, yeah. here's what you're called to, mm-hmm. he's being called, and Moses' response is, are you kidding me? That's yeah. eat? You want me to do what? Yeah. That's a, that's a. Go back. That's yeah. an impossible task. I mean, it, yeah. you know, and going back to you just saying, I want, if I can just help just one, if I could. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, God will call us out of our comfort zone and sometimes call us the things that look impossible. Yeah. And yeah. yet here you are, man. Nah, you, you don't, you hit the nail on, you hit the, what's that? The hammer on the nail. <laughs> uh, that was me. I ain't want to do none of the stuff I'm doing. I, 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 when I went back to college, um, in my early thirties, I really, I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do train development. Mm. That was my career path. Train development. And took all the courses, did what I need to do, graduated, with nobody hiring me. No one offered me a job. I think Mm -hmm. uh, Trevec University offered me a job, but I just couldn't accept the pay. Really, nobody else offered me a job in training development. And 2014, I just graduated from Trevec. I I know I'm going to get a job in training development. Somebody's going to hire me. 
And I was working in the factory and I was praying one night and God said, if you serve the fatherless, the fatherless, I'll get you out the factory. Hmm. Clear as daylight. I'll never forget that. I'm praying, I'm crying, I was like, I'm tired, I'm spending all this money on LinkedIn, yeah. resumes, and God says, serve the fatherless, and i get you out the factory. Mm-hmm. And I started an after-school program, worked, 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 and now I've been full-time with Strong and My Father since 2018. Wow. And it still, still has its challenges, ups and downs, peaks and valleys, financial, but um, I've enjoyed the journey. I've enjoyed the journey and through the ups and the downs. But one thing I tell myself is that I was able to get out the factory life, but um, my father didn't want me to do it. He knew the factory was a stable job. Nonprofit is not always stable. But when he saw me on television one day doing some work, uh, we got highlighted for something we was doing. And my father knew, okay, this is what my son is doing now. And from there, our, our conversation is a lot easier because, mm-hmm. you know, in a father, remember he's protecting Mark. You don't need to, you need, you need to stay here. But I just knew that God had built me to do so many other things outside of working in a factory. So I was like, I gotta go. Mm-hmm. Told my wife, Hey, I'm out. We're gonna struggle some, but we're gonna find a way to make it. Mm-hmm. And um, God has sustained us. And so it's not easy. I tell anybody that that goes into nonprofit work. It's it's one of the hardest jobs out here because you always gotta ask for money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that was something that I was never used to doing, but. I think when you talk about the Moses experience, that was clearly me. And I think what helps me a lot, because the flesh wants to go back to be what Moses was. Even now, yeah. I, I still have that feeling. But the spirit says, you got to go out here and serve. You know, you got to help people. You got to go out. Because my mother told me this. Uh, she said, son, you was blessed with a wealth of knowledge from two parents. She said, son, if you can't save one child, you selfish. Hmm. She said, you are selfish. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. So that's why I'm always thinking about my boys and my program. And, I'm, I'm, you know, they're okay. They save. You know, my wife said, Mark, it's spring break. Rest. And I'm like, all right, who can I go pick up tomorrow? Who can I go grab some breakfast with? You know, just that father mode's always in me. Yeah. I don't know if it'll ever leave, but that's why I really enjoy mentorship, you know. And I look forward to the opportunity to help serve fathers and help dads. Is it broken in certain areas where we can try to help give you life so you can save your child. The biggest thing yeah. for me is that save your child because your child is looking for you to be an example for him. And kids yearn for their fathers. They yearn for their fathers. Mm-hmm. And so that's the thing that I see. When I come home, my kids are ex- excited to see me. You know, I don't come in the house, leave me alone. You know, I've had a hard day. You know, give me five minutes. I'm happy to see them, that they're alive, they safe. That, that's like that brings the joy of my life when I come into the garage. And I'll give you another father tip. I'm going to give them all of them because they be in my book. Um, <laughs> that my father told me this. Mm-hmm. He said, every day you pull in your garage, whatever you've had a hard day, you leave it in the garage. When you walk in that house, that house needs to be a house of peace. Mm-hmm. And you do that, Mark. So here day I come in the garage. I say, all right, God, tough day. But now I'm a dad. I'm not Marcus was strong in my father when I get in the garage. I'm just that. And so my kids see me, they're happy. Dad, I did this, I did that. I'm happy to hear that. And so that's where a house of peace needs to look like. Mm-hmm. And not come in cussing and fussing and going off on your kids. Because your kids remember that. Your kids remember the hollering and the fussing. That's why your brains are wired that way. They remember those things. So a father should always lead the, ha- the family with peace. And that's the thing that I was taught by my parents. And that's the thing that I try to teach. So I've had a long day today. I am super, super tired. But when I pull in that garage this afternoon, I'm going to first of all, thank God I made it home. And the next thing is that, where's my kids? Where's the wife? Hey, everybody good? Let's watch some TV. Mm-hmm. Those are examples that I like to bring to the table. It might not work for everybody, but I think just having a house of peace means so much to me. And um, and that's why I enjoy going home every afternoon because I know when I get home, it's going to be peaceful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you're right because you think about it when you're when you're a kid and you do absorb a lot of things and the yep. things that go into your mind, whatever. But if you if you think about this now that we're adults, yeah, and you reflect back on your childhood, yeah, you don't necessarily get to pick and choose what things stuck in your mind and what things didn't. That's a good example. So so 
there are certain things that might be negative. If, if all you see is negative, like I have some of that stuff that's in my mind, then I'm yeah. like, why, did, why do I remember that? <laughs> and I don't remember a lot of these other good things. Yeah. Because you don't get to pick and choose. So as adults then, when we're raising our kids, and mm-hmm. I have four kids. I have two boys and two girls. Oh, wow. That's good. And and I, I try to think about that. I don't get to pick and choose the things that they're going to remember. Yeah. So what I need to do is stack the good things, stack the exactly. wise things, so that the more of that good, it, it's more likely he's going to stick with them as yeah. opposed I know I'm going to have moments. Listen, we're human beings. We're yeah. going to make mistakes. We're going to have disagreements with our spouses. We're going to have those kind of things. But limit those things. Yeah. So that the good is what takes over in their mind. Yeah, man. You, my my boys, man, remember so many good things of what happens at home, like run up and down the steps, or if I'm playing Madden on television. You know, my kids remember that, and that's the thing that I'm trying my best to do. Mm-hmm. Um, my mother told me that if you and your wife have a disagreement, do it away from the kids. Don't mm-hmm. argue in front of your kids. Now, I love to debate. That's why I probably have a podcast, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> So a lot of times me and my wife, we'd be hard, we were debating hard. Yeah. And my kids may assume we're arguing. So my oldest would say, break it up, break it uh. up. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. Because like, I love, I debate you all day. Uh. I debate you all day. But um, I think the biggest thing is that my kids know they're not afraid when I come home. Mm-hmm. They don't have to run and say, dad's here, let me go hide. My kids sometimes meet me in the garage. Daddy home. Mm-hmm. I love that. And so your kids should not, you know, you need to put fear in them to understand consequences. But my kids ain't scared of me. Mm-hmm. They come home, you know, oh, I, I see my son, my youngest son every day. I make sure he comes in the car happy. That's how I like to live. And I tell people, live the way you want to live. Mm-hmm. Live where you want to live. But remember... There's always consequences behind everything. Yeah. So if you cuss your kids out, what they going to do? Cuss somebody else out. So because kids' brains absorb pretty much everything that's going on. That's why when parents fuss about TikTok and everything else, I'm like, don't give them a phone. And so I was even made fun of because I didn't give my kid, my oldest son a phone until he was in ninth grade. You don't need no phone. You come home every day. What mm-hmm. do you need a phone for? Mm-hmm. And so now... My son, like he can't live without it. <laughs> so uh, I had to, I had to monitor that with him, um, with his phone. I monitor that. So what do you do when you talk about monitoring that? Like, put it up. You, yeah. That's it. That's it. I put it up. Mm-hmm. If you got a problem with it, pay your own bill. I look him dead in the eye. Pay yeah. your own bill. Do you check what he, what he's doing on his phone? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I even realized he gonna kill me if he ever heard this podcast. <laughs> uh, he had some girl. He was texting. I love you. Stuff like that. And my son at 15 is a 15-year-old version of me. Easy. Mm -hmm. Easy. The way he loves church, the way he loves God. I told my parents, I I went to my parents' house on Monday just to hang with him. And I said, I'm looking at him and I'm looking at myself at 15. And I was told you cannot treat him the way you was treated at 15. You got to let him learn. You got to let him live. And those things, my wife keep calling me. She don't know where I'm at. <laughs> She's like, where are you? Uh, but um, my 15-year-old son, I just watch him now. So with his phone, yeah, I'm watching. Because lots of he, he he's, um, well, you know, iPhone, you can share and everything. So pretty much when he reaches look up, I can look on my phone. Yeah. So when he had the phone, me and my wife set him down. I said, here's the rules. Anything inappropriate, you won't see your phone to 18. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. And I will take it away from him to protect my child until he turns 18. Yeah. And I don't care if you get mad. If you get mad, I turn into my dad. Yeah. Like, we're going to fight and one of us going to win. And my days tell me that, hey, we're going to fight, but I'm going to win. But it's, it's just me protecting my kid, man. I'm just protecting my boy um, from the things that he sees so he don't turn into those things. Well, one of the things that this just occurred to me, you know, all, all my kids know my phone unlock passwords. Wow. My kids are on my stuff all the time. Wow. And so technically they could see everything that I'm doing too. Yeah. And, and so I, it doesn't bother me at all because they're not going to see anything that, that I've been on or yeah. whatever it may be. So that's just another part of, of leading. Yep. 
There you go. And letting them understand, like, this is how we act in this family. Yeah. You're not going to be able to protect things. I mean, if, you, if you're on Instagram, you're on TikTok, you're whatever, and you yeah. just go to a search thing, listen, that's that's going to populate a bunch of stuff that don't need to be seen anyway. Yeah. That So, but at the same time, uh, no secrets. Yeah. Right? So yeah. da- dads, if you're in the home, you know, no secrets with that as well. We're, we're running out of time here, and I think okay. this is important. Um, StrongerThanMyFather.org is mm-hmm. the website. Yeah. Uh, and it's a nonprofit. Do you operate by yourself or do you have a team of people? I have a team of people. Yeah. And so yeah. what happens with, with the team? Like if, if we were to go to the website and, and look through Stronger Than My Father, mm-hmm. uh, what does the organization do and how does it walk alongside people? Do you focus on the kids? Do you focus on adults? What, what do you guys um, do? Right now, the biggest part, thing we do is the mentorship. I pretty much run that right now because we don't have funding to hire Somebody to run mentorship the way I want it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have an after school program where a team of seven runs the after school that that's K two five pre K two fifth, where we drop kids off to school uh, at school and then we pick them up in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, so we primarily is mentorship and before and after school. I just added the mom component as a support group for the boys is in our mentorship program, and so that program is called Mom with Purpose. It's still in development. But eventually, by the fall, that's going to be where we give support to moms to the kids that's in our program. Uh, that they meet once a month. It's just a parenting class that they come together, talk about some of the issues, and find some situations to resolve those issues. Mm-hmm. Some that you need, we try to find resources to help you as well. So that's what we're trying to develop and grow there. And then we do a number of community initiatives: uh, give out turkeys, give out Christmas gifts. Uh, we support uh, our backpack initiative with our city council. So we also give back. But yeah. my team, my board, um, board members who are great individuals who helped me out, put up with me. <laughs> I probably ain't the easiest one to put up with. But um, that team is great. Um, they helped me out a whole lot. Um, they try to stick with me because they like, this guy Mark's always on the go. Visionary, trying to find ideas and, and things to help kids mm-hmm. uh, and help families, which I want to yeah. definitely go into more in the fall. We are actually trying to launch our mentorship program in Williamson County in the Franklin School District area. So look for that in the fall. Okay. Where we're expanding Stronger Sons. And so our goal is to start in Williamson, then we go to Murfreesboro next. Okay. So that's the thing that we're trying to build for the future. Man, well, you have to be a visionary to start a nonprofit. Heck yeah. It is, it is hard. <laughs> I don't see I've how never people done do it. one, but I've seen people do it, and I'm like, man. Well, the average, um, we're 11 years in. The average nonprofit lasts three to five years, mm. and then they fold. Because they don't have certain tools and funding. Uh, I just work, man. And I let my story do the rest. My story has helped us gain funds. But the thing is, is that I can back up what I talk. Yeah. I can back up uh, the mentorships. You can go on our social media and see all our mentor sessions. And we've only missed one session in almost two years. That's because we had the recent snow. Mm-hmm. Every two weeks, tell these parents, get your boys up. And if we got somewhere we got to be early in the morning, get them up, get them here. Yeah. Because I'm volunteering my time. So you got to get up and you got I know they tired on Saturday. And I tell them, don't come inappropriate dress. <laughs> That's good. I say, have some, I said, stop wearing these Crocs. I said, put some tennis shoes on. Uh-huh. So I'm building um, with Stronger Sons, which I hope would be one of the most dominant programs out here where parents know you put them in Stronger Sons, they have the best shot of being being a productive young man. So mm. um, I just appreciate you bringing me on. I, it feels good for the first time uh, being on the other side of the mic instead of me asking all the questions. So I hope through your podcast, other people see me and say, hey, come on my podcast. Cause yeah. I'll be happy to come on there and talk. I love doing what I do uh, with mentorship, just giving advice, you know, support. Um, I love it because I have people that pour into me. Yeah. So I got people pouring to me um, all the time, um, listen to advice and stuff like that. And I really, really enjoy that. But I appreciate you inviting me. I was truly honored. I was so excited. That's why I probably forgot to tell my wife I was doing this. That's why she keep calling <laughs> uh, I totally forgot to tell her that I was doing this podcast this evening. Uh, but I really appreciate your time and just um, letting people learn more about myself yeah. and, uh, and learn about the organization. Well, I absolutely love what you're doing. Thank uh, you. I, I think it is it's vital. Yeah. Uh, to what is going on in our world today. I, I feel like it's one of these uh, secrets that's hiding in plain sight, yep. which is the the lack of good fathers in the home, yeah. too many single moms raising kids. Yeah. Uh, and 
when I saw at first I love your the name of it. I, I yeah. stronger than my father's is yeah. wonderful. I do gotta ask you this question though. Sure. Is, you know, because you're clearly the visionary guy yeah. in this whole thing and you're the face of the organization, whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now often now I might be wrong in this, often when you have a visionary person, uh you, you don't usually have the administrative skill. Do you have do you have both the administrative skill no, or do you nah, have somebody nah, I, don't, I don't like managing people. I was about uh, to yeah, say yeah, so like so do you folks. have somebody who handles yeah. the administrative side for yeah, you? Yeah, I have a uh a program director that runs that side. Okay. Helps me helps me on that side. But now I'm not I, I realize with the after school I, I don't like managing people. Yeah. Cuz I'm I'm always I'm always trying to move forward. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I want to hear your problems. I want to hear I just, I just want to find somebody that's like that's a visionary like hey look, we can build this, we can do this. Mm-hmm. That's what I look for the most. Um uh, is that that kind of like Jordan and, and Scotty Pippen. You need to have that Pippen beside uh-huh. you in nonprofit. You need that one. And yeah. I have some real good friends, real good guys that follow, helps volunteer their time. Um, some of the mm-hmm. mentors uh, who helps me out, great guys. These guys I can call for almost anything, and they're there. And um, and one I call all the time for ideas and stuff. So yeah, yeah. It, I'm just a visionary. I got I have ideas that can help um, nonprofits with trying to generate funds and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it's just things I look at problems. I'm like, all right, this is the problem. If you do this, you got a chance of fixing some of the problems. So that's what I am. Right. But to answer your question in a nutshell, don't like managing people. <laughs> I just really look for just one person that I can meet with. This, this isn't that. Then y'all take off. Right. But the other part, I'm not interested in. Yeah. You want me to tell you a, a totally off, yeah. off the off track of what we're talking about? But since yeah. you just mentioned it, I'm going to go ahead and say it because I yeah. grew, up, grew up in Chicago. Yeah. So do you know that, like, you know, in the 80s, I grew up and I had the 85 Bears. And so I had Walter Payton and yeah. I had all that stuff. And then I was in, uh, you know, middle school and high school were the Bulls era of the 90s. Michael Jordan, yeah. Scotty Pippen and all that. Are you jealous that I got to grow up and be in that city? No. Well, that was... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I want a big Bulls be. fan. I want a big Bulls fan, but... Oh, come on, I'm man. Not, but I do watch The Last Dance all the time. Do you? My, my wife says, why do you watch it all the time? It's the motivation. Motivated. Like, Jordan didn't want to let nothing stop what he was trying to accomplish. Mm. And so I'm the same, mentally the same way. I don't want nobody to try to stop what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm. And from writing a book that I'm looking to put out and speaking podcasts, podcasts just came out the blue. Mm. I knew I could talk on the mic. Um and I had some people say, it ain't going to go nowhere, you know. And then you get one clip that goes over a million views. Then people learn about you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like proving people wrong. So uh-huh. maybe that's not a good thing. But I have tell, a last dance quote that yeah. I'm about to throw at yeah, you. Yeah, when people tell me that you can't do something, people tell me, hey, you can't do that, do that. And I'm like Michael Jordan. Um, I put that on my checklist. Mm-hmm. I'm going to remember that. Because mm-hmm. that's actually what helped me get to college where people tell me that I wasn't smart enough. Mm-hmm. You know, you weren't smart as your brother, my youngest brother. And I remembered that. Mm-hmm. And so when I graduated, I would just look at him. And I said, anything else you want to challenge me? Which one of my nicknames I named myself is the Black Mamba. Like I go to another mode where I just say, you know what? I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's not the best motivation, but that's what helps Marcus Manise mm-hmm. is that not so much to throw it in your face, but just show you what God can do with anything you put your mind to. Mm-hmm. Put your mind to it, and it's alignment with God. It's going to happen. So usually I just smile at you and I walk off. Yeah. But you're going to know that you messed with the wrong one. Yeah. So that's just my motivation. Oh, I love so it. what quote do you have? I think I think it's the end of episode seven Yeah. when Jordan is sitting there and he's, he's talking about um, how he wasn't liked by his teammates and in the different yeah. things he had to do yeah. and the role that he felt he had to play on the team, whether people liked it or not, he mm-hmm. felt like he had a specific role. And he said, you know, people sit back and, and they might not like the way I, I do things and they didn't want to be a part of it. And he goes, but that's you. Yeah. And, and you ain't never won yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. You never won anything. And he said, and so for me, that's how I play the game. Yeah. He goes, and if you don't want to play that way, don't, don't play that way. Don't play that way. And then he yeah. said, and then he said, cut. Cut. And then, he, and then that was the end of the thing. You he know? took it so here's the thing. He took it so serious. And for what I do, I take it serious what I what I do. And if you don't like the way markets go, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. I only I only tell God, let's 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 shock the world. Mm-hmm. I tell God that all the time. 
I'd be driving like, all right, God, let's go shock the world. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. It's like that's my pippin right now. Mm-hmm. It's God. And he's opened so many doors, doors that I even know. I didn't know so many people who watch you on social media, who watches uh, what I do, that reach out mm-hmm. and say, hey, Marcus, can I interview you or if I can go do this? I'm always honored and when someone calls me for an interview or can you come speak here. Uh, I spoke at a conference back in September. I'm honored. Because at the end of the day, I don't get caught up in none of this. I do the work, then I go home to my family. Um, but in, along the way, if I can touch somebody's life, um, I tell my wife all the time, when I die, I don't mention where I went to college because it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I want to be sure I help somebody have a shot. Mm-hmm. That's all I want to be. That's all yeah. I want on my tombstone is, may the work I've done on this earth speak for me. I don't want mm-hmm. I don't want a lot. I'm not caught up in all the glamoring stuff of being recognized and all this stuff. Yeah. Care less. Well, in in for stronger than my father, you know, we talk about you being a visionary. If you mm-hmm. have a, a vision for the organization of, of what you see, you see it out there being, mm-hmm. okay, then your mission becomes how you're gonna get to that vision. Yeah. Right? And that's what you do. And then that becomes your singular focus, right? Mm-hmm. That you want to be there for these these kids. Mm-hmm. You want you want uh, to be there for them in, in a role that show them what a, a strong father is like. So yeah. that as they grow up, they'll become strong parents as well. Yeah. And they'll be present in the home and they'll learn from your example, whatever. That that to mm. me is your vision, right? Yeah. And then and then I'm sure you have a, a mission of, of how you're gonna get there. So what I hear for you though is then when you, when you're so singularly focused on that, like that's mm. what I want to do. Then I don't got time for I don't, I don't need to explain myself. I don't need yeah. to, <laughs> that becomes the challenge of the nonprofit raising funds part of it. Yeah. When people want you to you know go give me the whole the details. Well, well I love doing about that. This, I know? actually love doing that. Do you really? Um, yeah, yeah. Somebody sit down like say you want to fund the organization mm-hmm. and you ask me probably thirty questions. That don't bother me. That don't bother me at all. Um, I just completed a grant with the Phoenix Club of Nashville, and they ask all kind of questions. Mm. I'm trying to get the money so we can do the work. Right. So can't get offended by that. I think the thing that bothers me is I don't like dealing with a lot of problems. I do not. You bring me a lot of problems. I don't want to hear it. That's why I got to eventually hire directors that can handle problems that know how to navigate their world. Mm. Let markets just have a clear vision like I'm driving. Yeah. I don't need a lot of is- disruptions in my life right now. And I think that's sometimes what my wife and director, everybody say, Mark, you know, you got to pass it on. You got to delegate. You got to do this because my mind is not built to deal with a lot of problems. Yeah. It's you need, not. You need to hire Vanilla Ice. <laughs> if you got a problem, yo, he'll, yeah, sol- he'll yeah. solve it. Yeah, I just, I just, I'm just not built. I'm, I'm, current, I'm honestly, I'm honestly just not built for it. Um, and so that's why, you know, if moms have issues, they reach out to my wife, talk to her first. Mm. Then my wife knows how to bring it to me where it's not going to frustrate me. Because mm. if a mom calls me yelling or fussing, it's like like I'm driving off the road. Like, I don't know what I need to do, you know. But if you tell me calmly, then I can sit down and try to think and mm. analyze um, the situation. And that's what helps me a whole lot yeah. uh, in, in, in navigating my world. And so... Try to be the visionary. I try to, you know, bring ideas to the table that I think that can help families and help parents have different, better opportunities. Because, like I said, I know it's tough out here. I don't know it always personally, but I know when I see single mom tell me their stories, then I'm just like, wow, how do you do it? Mm. You know, how did you raise a child working two or three jobs uh, when it was never God's design for that to happen? You know, you just met a man that wasn't built to step up to the plate. And that's the problem. Men got to mm-hmm. step up to the plate. No matter the situation with the mother, I tell them, you fight for your child. That's your child that's looking up to you. Because eventually that child's going to grow into something. Do you want something good or do you want something bad? Yeah. But I tell the father, the choice is up to you. And so when I keep, when I look at my kids on my phone, I always look at them and say, I want to be the best father they ever had. So when my kids say, Dad, you're the best dad ever. You know, my kids say that to me all the time. Dad, you're the best day ever. You know how much that makes me feel, you know, and um, that's the thing on fatherhood that I tell people all the time. Be the best dad, fight for your children, and put God first, and put your children in God's hands, and they're going to be just fine. Yeah. But be the example, 
And, you know, and I tell fathers that watch how you treat females or your wife. You got to watch all this stuff because your kids, your kids are always watching. Yeah. And, I, and I tell them their brains are always recording. Their brains never stop recording. Even at 47, when I go to my parents' house to hang with mom and dad, I'm still watching. Mm-hmm. As a uh, as their son, I'm still watching daddy. I'm still watching what he does. And I'm truly thankful. I said this on my last podcast. I'm truly thankful for my mom and dad. Um, I know the older I live, they're going to leave this earth. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to act. <laughs> yeah. I know. But, don't but, even want to think about it, right? But, yeah, you don't want to think about it sometimes. But I know in my mind it's going to happen. Mm. But So that's why I soak up all the knowledge I'm like I'm like a I'm trying to soak everything out of them, so when they leave this earth, I know what to do. And I say this last thing because um, I can talk forever. You just got to tell me when to stop. Uh, <laughs> we was at, I give you this last example. We was at a marriage retreat, and this always tears me up. Um, we was at a marriage retreat in 05, and my mom and dad taught a class. My mom, my dad hardly ever talks, ever talks. Um, if anybody want to hear my dad talk, go to my Instagram. And you'll see a video of me and my dad talking simultaneously how we was raised. But they asked Mr. Manise, do you have anything that you need to say to the to the married couples? And my dad said, uh, I worked my boys hard, really hard, and people made fun of me. But he said, if I die tomorrow, my boys know how to make it. Mm-hmm. And that's all he said. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, if daddy went home tomorrow, uh, his sons know what to do. Mm-hmm. That's what every father should want to leave in their kids. So when God takes the father home, you're there to start to continue the cycle and continue to move people forward. Yeah, move your kids forward, and that's what chokes me up the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't cry on a lot of podcasts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I only cry, I only tear it up on one. Uh, but. Um, that's the thing I still remember in 05. That's nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. And my father said that. And um, and I just want, the thing I do all the time is just say, make them proud. Yeah. Make them proud. Make my children proud. Uh, and so my kids could say that their daddy did it right. And that's the only thing I want. I don't mm-hmm. want much more than that yeah. in my own life. But um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity, man. I really enjoyed myself no, here, man. This was great, man. And for everybody listening, this this is Marcus Menis. He is the head of Stronger Than My Father, and you got the podcast too. So people, yes. people can go turn around right now and jump on YouTube, jump on yeah. all the different streaming sites, and just put in Stronger Than My Father podcast. It comes up right there. Yeah, you got what I love is you have guests on the show usually, but you also have several shows where you it's just you kind of yeah. talking directly. I've been yeah. thinking more and more about doing that. Yeah, and I like to have guests on the show and have conversation, but I also like. Uh, I've only done one episode where I just go right at the camera. Yeah. And uh, that's helpful, too, because you need to get that out there. So, Well, I try to say things that um, is in my head um, that uh, if we don't have a guest, I say, all right, Jim, let me talk. You know, great friend, Jim McCarthy, that's my buddy. Yeah. Um, I just say what's in my head. You know, one of my ideas about decisions and consequences, you know, and, and it resonated on TikTok. And it's just letting people know that your decisions affect your children and they suffer the consequences because of you. Mm-hmm. I don't want my kids to suffer different consequences because dad couldn't keep himself together. So if dad goes out there and cheat on my wife, who, 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 who loses mm-hmm. my kids, mm-hmm. right? They lose because dad's not going to be around. And then my youngest who always says, where's daddy at? And I have to tell my son that I was selfish I only thought about myself, and now y'all are gonna hurt through this. I'm not doing that to them. Mm-hmm. So when I'm tempted to go mess up, I look at my two kids' pictures on my phone. I look at those two. Yeah. And I say, I love you too much for that. Now I'm tempted, I'm human, I'm not God. But I look at those two boys and I say, I'm not gonna hurt my I'm gonna try not to hurt my babies. Mm-hmm. That's that's how I live. Yeah, the, the previous senior pastor of this church, Paul Bain, had a, a great mm. saying. I don't know if, if he coined it or if he got it from somewhere else, but it's a great saying that goes along with what you're talking about. He mm. said, in every decision, mm-hmm. maximize the consequences mm-hmm. and minimize the pleasure. Wow. 
I like that one. So that when you have that, maximize the consequences. Mm-hmm. How's this going to damage my kids? How's yeah. this going to damage my life? Yeah. How's this going to damage my, my wife, my family? All that stuff across the board. Maximize the consequence yeah. and minimize the pleasure. Yeah. This, just just this few minutes of play. I'm gonna I'm gonna trade in all that. Yeah. For just this few moments of a bad decision. Yep. No, sorry. That means that because the consequences, and that's why you know you see my catchphrase say the cycle ends with me. That's why you have cycles mm-hmm. because somebody was selfish and thought about themselves over their children. And I work hard. Like I said, I'm tempted to do wrong all the time, but I really. And then here's the thing that I'm writing my book as well is that I've seen so many devastating consequences. I've seen it. First hand. So I saw a quote on Facebook that says, when a man falls, you learn. Don't laugh at him. Mm. You learn. Because the same thing that took him down could turn around and take you down as well. Right. So I don't laugh at people if I see them make mistakes right. or they damn right. their family. Write that down. I watch. I'm like, wow. Right. Look, look what happened to the kid. Look what happened to the wife. All because he made this move. So I'm like, do I want my family to go through that when mm-hmm. they don't have to? And so, yeah, that little moment of pleasure, man, it's rough. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, and those are things that, honestly, you know, and pastors have that because you have a whole congregation of people. Yeah. That that who are who look to you as a, a spiritual shepherd of a congregation. Yeah. And, and when you have not only your family, but then you also have people who are, who are looking to you for mm-hmm. that as well. You have to be mindful of that. What is this going to do to the spiritual lives of people? who are placed under my care. That's why yeah. the Bible says that God holds pastors yeah, more true. accountable. Yeah, your, your job is harder, man. So <laughs> Way uh, harder than me. Yeah. I would not trade with you. <laughs> well, no, I'm not saying it's hard. No, I lo- listen, man. But I, but, I, you, but I appreciate people who want to go into ministry like mm-hmm. that. I really do, man, because you have to speak into lives every week and lives of people that's hurting, lives of people who's going through different things. And... They're looking upon God and yourself to give me a word to help deal with some of the things I'm dealing with in my life. So, you know, pastors have a hard job, but your life means the world to people when you're living the life. Mm. And that's that's why I tell parents, like, listen, live the, even with me, man, I, I got to do the same. I don't speak to people's lives like you do. But if I start causing problems in my own life, I can't go out here and help other people because I'm trying to deal with these problems that I didn't have to do. And mm. that's why I tell it's important to try to do right. Yeah. Well, every calling has it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. mine's not easier. Yours isn't easier. They, yeah. ever, they all yeah. have their hard moments. Yeah. Right? So that, but if you're called to it uh, and you have that end, that vision in mind where God has called you to, that's that gets you through those hard moments, right? Yeah. So for sure, man, we got to wrap this up. Yeah. Well, we are we uh, out of time. Uh, this is fun, man. This has been a lot of fun. So anyway, special thanks to you, Marcus Manise, for being on here today. Please go to strongerthanmyfather.org. Look yeah. for ways that you can help the organization. Look for ways if, if you yeah. can bring Marcus in to come and speak. Well, to love your to come speak, man. I won't disappoint you. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, listen, man. I mean, anybody who listened to this knows that you know what you're doing. Yeah. And, and that you would bring a lot of benefit to yeah. any, any place that you come and talk to. So anyway, and check out his podcast, Stronger Than My Father yeah. podcast. Don't so. hit the subscribe button. <laughs> Try to get a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. Yeah, do but, it. But check yours out. So yeah, I'm gonna make sure I follow yours as well, man. So we, I think you both support you, you support each other, um, and I think that's what makes the world great when people can support each other. Yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody, thank you for listening uh, this week, and we'll be back with a new episode next week. But please go check out Stronger Than My Father. And uh, yeah, tell your friends, tell your family, subscribe to the podcast, tell your friends to do that and family to do that as well, because, uh, you know, this is a pretty good one to be listening to. So Appreciate anyway, it. all right, guys, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.